Welcome to this video. Yeah, this is round five coverage recap of this fifth round of the Tata Steel tournament. A little bit late this upload time, but I couldn't really do it earlier. The thing was that um, for this round, I actually did the live broadcast for the ICC together with Grandmaster Joel Benjamin. Yeah, Joel was the main analyst in this um, in this duo. I was moderating the show in a way and also helping to analyze a little bit. It was a really long broadcast, almost six hours. And I can assure you, if you are on, on the air for six hours, after that you don't do much besides, well, eating a bit and falling asleep. <laughs> so I decided to not um, really produce the video uh, after this uh, marathon, but rather delay this um, till the next day so that I'm actually awake when the video is produced. Okay, let's have a look at this round. It was a very interesting round, I think. Many interesting games. And this means that I have to um, be a bit brief about um, some of the games um, that were, well, they they, some of them even had points of interest, but if I look at them all, uh, this is a two hour video. So we start with Vashila Graf with white against Luke Van Veli. Both players didn't really have a good tournament so far. Let's see how they fare in this encounter. Yeah, Van Veli plays e6, a6. The Khan variation, not a very usual choice for him. He normally is a knight of player and um, does not go for that so often. The main difference between this kind of setup and um, the knight of, for example, is that white has this option of playing c4, which Carlsen did in the World Championship match, for example. But Vashila Graf here only uh, went for bishop e2, only is the wrong word. Um, yeah, he forfeited this option to play c4. And uh, now we get a standard type of position that could have uh, could have um, also risen from a knight of. It's um, in fact transposing to a Treveningen kind of setup. I'm not totally great on this pronunciation, but it's not so far off. At least when I compared this to Joel Benjamin's pronunciation, mine was a bit, a bit nearer, the tr <laughs> nearer to the truth. Okay, well, this kind of line was very popular even back in the, the 80s and 90s when uh, Kasparov was still playing. He was a real champion of this setup with black, had many encounters against um, Anatoly Karpov in the 80s, later against um, Nigel Short, against Arnand, lots of um, great players on the, on the white side as well. Um, it's a flexible setup for white with good piece development. White has um, more than one idea. Um, he can sometimes play for a g4, g5 base attack, or he can play in the center. And um, Vashila Graf here is going for a central approach. He's putting a4 out, bishop f3. So those bishops are more aimed towards the queen side. And this is not so much leading to a king side attack. The idea is also, if we look at this here, that white is now threatening to play a5 and getting a piece to b6. So black feels inclined to play b6. And this is the start of a tactical phase of the game initiated by the move a5. Um, a somewhat funny thing is that both sides here spend huge chunks of time, despite this being a very well-known uh, theoretical position. Um, Van Veli is actually an expert on this opening, so it's kind of surprising that he spent more than 30 minutes up to this point. And Vashie, who is normally really excellently prepared, also spent lots of time. So that was kind of surprising. And uh, yeah, white blasts open the position with a5 and e5, an early skirmish here yeah, based on the long diagonal. Black played now rook d8. That's a necessary move, really. If you do this, then something like this leads to trouble. Yeah, like here, here. And white um, ends up being uh, much better. 
this is the right move. And there are some examples in the database of that, but um, I couldn't really figure out what the current theoretical state is. Um, I mean, it looked like the statistic suggests it's about equal, but um, it's hard to tell without um, a super deep analysis. Yeah, queen e2 was played, knight d5, it's quite logical. And now we trade down to a simplified position. It's clear that if we look at the next couple of moves, that this wasn't the greatest opening result ever for white. Yeah, a simple count of pawns, um, yeah, it gets us to the, to the conclusion that we have equal material. And uh, well, black has this active position and this weak pawn on e5 to attack. Uh, after some trades, yeah, yeah, we, we came to this. And um, from here, it is a pretty straightforward affair, leading to a position where black is just this pawn up, but it's all on one side of the board. It's a very pure position if you want. Eh? <laughs> There's, the pawns have not moved, but just, just one extra pawn for black. Um, this is not a position that um, black should win. And um, the, the way the game went basically confirmed that this should be a draw. The only fun, little funny side note, um, uh, funny is a bit is a bit much maybe, but um, there's still situation where I'm, situations where I'm amazed at what computers um, evaluate. I just just want to show you one thing. Yeah, in in this situation, I think it's it's really amusing that if you use this, if you use a computer and you give it this position, it, there are still evaluations of a pretty substantial advantage for black by the engines, while this position is, I mean, the, the, the dread, deadest draw ever, yeah? I mean, there is no, um, dead is dead, there is no um, exaggerated uh, form of that, but this is ju just completely drawn. This is even a draw without the H pawn, yeah? With, when black has two pawns, because of the, here, the, the wrong colored bishop. Yeah, if, if you look at it with table basis, of course, the computer plays perfectly, but just by pure calculation and um, basic evaluation, the computer, all engines uh, still, still think that black is substantially better. It's really funny. Yeah, they really have no grasp of a um, of, of fortress type of situation. In the game, white got the H point back and they agreed a draw. It was, um, there was no real winning chance. If it is on one side of the board, three against two, five against four, this kind of thing can be, um, can be winning with a minor piece, but not two, three against two. Okay, so a draw in this game. And um, then we had Ding Li Ren, our tournament, he's not the tournament leader, Ivan Shuk is leading the tournament, but Ding was on second place with three wins in a row. Yeah, he lost the first round and then three wins in the following games. Yeah, we had a Slav against Ivan Shuk. Ivan Shuk is leading the tournament. He only conceded one draw. He won all three white games with the open Sicilians. Yeah, interestingly enough, we got a um, triangle Slav, where white has um, some, some choice now. Um, Ding chose the most conservative move here, e3. Um, not a bad move, obviously. My move here is uh, queen c2. I always like the idea to um, later get to a situation where I get the bishop out and play e3. It's a very harmonious uh, setup. The drawback is, of course, that it moves the queen quite early and sometimes often in the opening. Yeah, if, if black does that, for example, he can take, I have to move the queen, I have to move it again. Yeah, but I get a pneumonia setup. This is actually a line that I can recommend very much for white. Yeah, but e3 is of course fine as well, but just, um, it's a bit conservative. b3, b6, yeah, they develop. Uh, it's all very normal. Um, in this position, however, it's quite surprising, the next move. Yeah, Ding now plays g3, which is a novelty. <laughs> Not very surprising that this is a novelty because it looks uh, it looks really creative. I mean, white has played e3, so the most natural move in the world is to play bishop d3. I mean, maybe bishop e2, yeah, but bishop d3 looks very normal. 
Uh, maybe hinting at an e4 move at a later stage and uh, it just fits into the position but he went g3 hmm. yeah it's not a bad move it's just <laughs> somewhat unconventional and Ivanchuk is uh, is uh, just playing the same thing <laughs> g6 okay so got this can hardly believe the clock times i'm not sure that the clock times for this game are correct because we um, we had a, a relay error and we only relatively late got got the moves here for this. Okay, so queen e2, queen e7, a4. Yeah, white is maybe trying to push a5, creating weaknesses on the queen side. So black played a5. Yeah, what is the main feature of this position? Yeah, the main feature of this position is that we are almost symmetrical in a way if you look at the king side yeah like this side of the board yeah okay that was a bit of a crude way to show it but this is totally symmetrical so here everything's basically equal both sides have fear and shadowed the queen's bishop as well and this is also symmetrical so <laughs> the only thing that is a little bit different in the position is is the c and d file yeah, we have um, a situation where white is a little bit more aggressively posted with c4 and knight c3 against the knight on d7. Black will try to, um, let's say, equal this thing as well to play c5. And we see that, bishop a3, c5. So the pawn structure now is entirely symmetrical. And what we get is some kind of trade in the center. And um, it um, will revolve about around hanging pawns hanging pawn structures or maybe isolated pawn structures that happen after captures. Um, in the game, we see that after rook c1, rook d8, yeah, rooks are centralized, knight b5 was played. Yeah, in this situation, for example, white could have taken already here, just to show one idea. If black then recaptures, we could get the typical hanging pawns. Those two pawns are the hanging pawns. Here white has queen b5, however, yeah, attacking b7 and a5. Um, these kind of um, transformations are the, the story of this game. Um, Ding plays knight b5, however, does not take. And now knight e4, that's very logical. Yeah? The knight goes away from the center to b5 to maybe create something on the queen side and black uses his time to jump into the middle of the board knight d2 to trade off this knight and knight e6 so we have this this trade yeah and here ding decides to um to change the the overall structure um this uh, it seems that this leads to to not much or nothing <laughs> But um, it's not clear that he had anything substantially better. Um, if white really wants to fight for something here, he probably has to do something else. Yeah, I mean, taking on c5, this guy, keeping keeping some tension in the position. It's probably around equal anyway. But uh, this is here. Yeah, this is a very simplistic approach. He just took the knight and took on c5. And um, after this, we. Um, get to a situation where the queen side is completely completely frozen black um, has two against three here and uh, the two pawns simply completely um, limit white here it's, it's very hard to make any progress in fact here after those trades here a couple of trades and they flicked in this kind of repetition and um, this way um, drew the game very quickly a bit of a bit of a disappointing game between the two tournament leaders i mean ivanchuk leading the tournament and ding being on second place mm, i think probably um, the chinese player was going into this game with a mindset of playing relatively safe yeah this the, some decisions here hint to that yeah like this e3 move which is i mean really really not bad but I mean, if you are more aggressively inclined, you play stuff like, let's say, um, if you really want to win, yeah, with with all all might, you're not going e3 in this position. You play maybe knight c3, 
I invite the, the node to boom, very sharp stuff, or you go G3, um, yeah, offering this, this pawn as a gambit or whatever. Um, it seems he wanted to play a safe game and, and he got a safe game, but there was really nothing going on. So the status quo at the, um, yeah, for the leading two places has not changed here. Ivanchuk keeps his plus three score while Ding is on plus two. Okay, the next game we're going to look at is Ivan Sharic against, oops, Temur Rajabov. And um, the most positive thing um, for up to up to now for this tournament is that we didn't have any Berlin Wall. <laughs> yeah, this kind of opening that sometimes leads to, to boring positions. It, it's simply like that. And, um, well, here's the first Berlin for Rajabov. <laughs> It's a bit of a shame, yeah. He played those very sharp lines in the in the Rui Lopez, and uh, now he's one of those uh, converts, yeah, to, to play the, the Berlin defense. It's really a good opening, no doubt about it. But for the spectator, it's sometimes it's sometimes a bit dry. Yeah, Sharich plays d3, yeah, not going into the the end game, the the main line, and uh, d3 keeps a little bit more pieces on the board. However, after bishop c5, he now decided to go for this trade on c6. Yeah, this line is um, has been played uh, really often in recent years, um, also by uh, the world champion Magnus Carlsen. It leads to a, a somewhat simplified position with the trade, where Widus is maneuvering. Yeah, here with those kind of moves, Widus uh, maneuvering slowly, maybe hoping to get in some favorable pawn break later, yeah, like maybe f4 after the right preparation. Um, yeah, here Rajabov um, took a very pragmatic decision. He just took this knight. Yeah, so white gets this pawn structure here with the double pawn. The double pawns here are not weaknesses in it. The, the pawns they sell, they are not weaknesses, but um, they, in a way, um, yeah, limit the flexibility of both positions. We see later that it is about those pawns that the game is, um, yeah, here, here we see this b5 is coming and um, Sharic plays uh, queen queen to g4. Um, he could have played um, in, a, in a very simple fashion as well. He could have just, for example, if white wants nothing in this game, he can always trade and play a4, yeah, this, this kind of solution. And um, really not much is going on here. We will probably just trade more stuff like this and so on. It's a very equalish position. Um, he tried uh, for a little bit more with this queen sortie. And uh, again, he can trade on b5, play a4 and so on. But he played a4 first and now we get to this position. And here, um, I'm not completely sure that this is um, in white's interest because uh, While well, this is not far away from being symmetrical, one difference is that White's pawns are a little bit more advanced and somewhat easier to attack. We will see that in the game, um, after a couple of more moves, we come to this position, to this position, and here Black is a little bit more active. We already see that the, the rook is on before. Um, and um, here I think Sharich, while being slightly under pressure, I mean, really not a lot, but, but a bit, um, where he's playing, a, I think, an inaccurate move. If he goes rook to b1 now, he, he should um, keep the, 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 the equality um, pretty, pretty comfortably. Yeah, as of rook b8, for example. Rook take, oops, I'm sorry. Rook takes b4. Rook takes before knight b3 is one important, ah, come on, one important idea to get this counter attack against a5. Yeah, something like this could be a possible line. Yeah, and the a pawn will guarantee that white is, uh, is okay in this position. Um, what he did is c3, and now this is tricky. Black is coming to the second rank. And yeah, we see that it's hard to get rid of this rook. 
Um, he ultimately decided to play rook b1, but now we see that with bishop c5, a later knight b6 or knight c5 will put very awkward pressure on those pawns. They are simply easier to attack. Yeah, The white knight has no comparable activity, especially not from b1. And um, yeah, white now is in, in serious trouble. After some more moves here, he had to, to give up the a-pawn. And um, ultimately, we came to an end game. Yeah, black won this pawn. We came to, to, this, uh, to this end game where black um, definitely uh, should win with good technical play. It's um, just an extra pawn. We can continue a little bit more. Yeah, note that here you shouldn't take here on f2 in any case. This is not helping. And well, you cannot take here because of knight d4. Or maybe you can you to knight to g4 even. <laughs> but it's not necessary really. Yeah, what uh, Rajabov did is perfectly, perfectly fine. Knight d6. Here, here, and now he has the c pawn, the pure passer on the c file that is pretty far away from the rest of the pawns. This is a technically winning position and he does win it indeed with pretty little effort. What uh, what we can take from the technical phase of the game is that it's um, a clear point for centralization. Yeah, Black has the bishop on b2, which looks at um, the central squares and takes away a lot of squares from the knight. King coming to e6. And the knight on d6 is also nicely placed for central influence. It might come to b5 later. I think it did, yeah. Yeah, it, it did come to that, that point. Yeah, a, a nice little uh, thing is that if white steps forward here, it is a, a really a static checkmate, I believe. Yeah, the check is delivered by the, bish uh, by the pawn. This pawn is taking away d3. d4 is taken away by the knight e3 is taken away by the bishop and the king is taking care of those squares. That's really neat checkmate. Okay, well, white <laughs> stepped back and now ultimately black invaded here with, uh, with the king. Yeah, king b5 is a nice move, setting up this check provoking white to go back and then king c4 for complete domination knight b4 is coming or knight e3 depending on circumstance and the pawn will promote or black will just enter to the enter the position so rajabov with a win against ivan sharich yeah a good game by rajabov but um sharich really um had had problems right out of the opening when he allowed this um somewhat problematic pawn structure with this pawn structure he has to be very careful not get into into serious trouble okay the next game i'm going to look at is wesley so with white playing hu yifan let's go to that yeah so we have a rogozin queen's gambit declined that's in fact a very interesting line that nowadays is played very often on the top level we will also see a, a second game with this opening in this round between Carlsen and Aronian later. Yeah, um, why is this um, popular nowadays? One reason is that it um, is a little bit, it's a nice little hybrid between the Queen's Gambit and the Nimzu Indian. It gives black some chances for activity. It's, it's more active than, let's say, um, Bishop e7. Um, and um, it still is solid, so it's a good a good middle of the road approach. Um, let's see what happened here. Bishop g5, h6, bishop f6, queen f6, e3. This is a pretty solid way to to play this position, with bishop g5 and um, and h6, and then terrading on f6. It uh, leads to positions that are believed to be between slightly better for white and and about equal. We um, can continue a bit here. Bishop d7. One feature, the main feature of this position is that we have a total symmetry in case of pawn structure. So how does the position, let's say, um, 
Yeah, what is the difference between white and black in this position? It's piece activity. Why is it better developed? Rook on c1. It's got the pieces actively placed here. Black has to still catch up in development. What black has is a bishop pair. That's nice, but hmm, hard to use anyway because of the activity white can in, in any case basically almost all the time force um, some kind of simplification to that that black has to give up the bishop um, for example let's say this is not particularly uh, threatening but after a move like knight um, a queen to b3 this bishop has to trade on c3 sooner or later um, yeah black um, has pretty good chances to get an equal game if uh, he or she in this case um, it's not suffering from any direct problem right of the opening right right out of the opening in the first couple of moves white tries to activate this knight and also the queen so it's really a case of where to try to use the momentum that you have because of the better development knight c6 and knight b3 yeah retreating to avoid um, further trades if white is, some, is doing something very, um, let's say, um, unambitious in a way, like knight c6, the whole thing is immediately sorry, shifting towards black. Bishop is, is nice on c6, and it's not clear how white is continuing. It's not like he's got a, a brilliant mating attack quickly. White has to keep uh, pieces on the board and therefore went to b3. This is also not a, a retreat. Um, in a passive sense, but also something that prepares knight jumps to c5. Bishop e8 was played, which is actually a novelty. The move f5 is known from a game Aronian Arnand um, in 2014. Bishop e8 is a novelty and it seems to, to lead to a decent position. I mean, white does not have very much, it seems. a3 was played. F5. Yeah, note that the the time shown here for black is uh, is bogus. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, as mentioned, there were some uh, problems with the transmission of moves and times, um, probably due to the fact that they um, played this round not in Wijk an See but in Rotterdam. There are I think two rounds that are played in in different in, in differing cities, not in Wijk an See. Yeah, F5, <clears throat> F5 counter attacking the knight. And after queen e2, yeah, the queen was saying, after queen e2, we have this have this transformation. Yeah, so at the moment, black is a pawn up. What does white have for it? Yeah, he's got this move, activating the knight and attacking those two pawns. White will get something back here. And um, it gets very interesting. Here, by the way, bishop takes e6 was not particularly good. I mean, no, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. I mean... But didn't um, didn't lead to anything. Um, Black can just step to h8, and um, it's not not quite clear how White uh, should continue here. For example, if he plays Bishop d5, that's not um, that's not threatening very much. Black can just go like here, here b6, and um, it's pretty solid. What is this line? Or did I did I? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm wondering why. Well, why there's a pawn up, right? I'm um, sorry. I, I read my notes wrong. After King H8, I actually had Queen B2 in my in my um, analysis. Yeah, Bishop D5 you can play, but um, it's not uh, not leading to to very much. Okay. He went Bishop A2. Yeah, it's also, this is more interesting, yeah? keeping this knight takes um, e6 option open. But black now has an interesting way to play. She went knight f3 check. Funny, funny attacking move. Yeah, white um, cannot take because of queen g5, king h1, and e takes f, threatening mate and the queen. So black wins here. Yeah? White has to play king h1. <laughs> that much is clear. And now queen h4. Yeah, black is all of a sudden getting an attack, but well, it's not a very dangerous attack, but
but it can be dangerous it can turn out to be dangerous if white is not really um not really uh, circumspect in defense um he now decided to to transform the position um the next um, couple of moves are pretty much forced once white is um, deciding for that h3 was an interesting alternative that he did not play we analyzed knight g5 in the official in the official broadcast the live broadcast and we thought that this um is interesting for for both sides to play um it is okay for black yeah but um but um nothing special let's say uh, also for white nothing special yeah h3 was a was a decent alternative yeah for example when fight takes him and uh, goes for this black has um, king h8 and um bishop d5 this is a position that that white can can try for but the the problem is all the time that black has counter attacking ideas yeah with sacrifices here if you do something like that for example you run into this kind of business threatening queen here and rook h3 mate the move h3 is something that needs to be considered very carefully because it it pretty much sets up for a sacrifice on h3 so you have to be be ready for that yeah he played it simpler he took the knight and this now um, leads to a forced transformation bishop h5 now white has to take and play bishop g4 that was the only way to prevent bishop takes f3 winning in a very simple way yeah and now takes queen b2 okay bishop takes rook g1 this was um the idea of the white player he's a pawn down but he's got some ideas on the g file all of a sudden and possibly knight e6 is also a tactic that comes into consideration yeah black black takes the g file is open um so for mate on g7 very um very complicated situation here um she went rook f7 that seems to be best queen d4 and h5 no? covering covering the the bishop on g4 knight d3 intending to go to e5 yeah now we have a pretty forced sequence here with queen e7 white now has no other option than to trade and we enter yeah an end game it, it, i guess an end game is right but um it um it is still a very sharp position it's not i mean it's not really an end game in a technical sense but um it's all about being um, precise now at, at calculating the upcoming complications um the only question here really is was there some improvement for black black is a pawn up and potentially has a, a good active bishop but we also in the broadcast we couldn't really find a way forward black seems to be more comfortable but it, it's very hard to to find something um, to improve upon her play the way it went you know, white got some activity yeah this this pawn was taken and white installed this this knight here on f6 no? black however defended um defended uh, nicely uh, with this here and um in some other situations um black also had the pos the opportunity to take on f6 simply getting rid of this um, annoying knight but this is a decision that leads to a very one-sided game where only white can do something you shouldn't lose your nerve there yeah? the knight on f6 is a bit pesky and yeah? note that yeah here a mate is threatened huh? uh, but still you shouldn't really just um, take it huh? it's no problem to just cover cover the mate but here uh, white has yeah, so much activity that um, black probably cannot think about playing for a win anymore maybe in the last couple of moves there was an improvement but we didn't find it in the in the live broadcast and uh, well i added some some of my own thoughts and uh, some computer um, checks but 
that also didn't um, lead to anything very conclusive. Um, so we continue up to the next very critical position. So this is taken, white takes, king takes, e6. This is a very, very critical position now. We have a situation where black is a pawn up, but this is really not the story of this position. The whole thing revolves around the question, what is happening here? The king can now possibly invade. White has the far more active king, obviously, and black is um, the one um, needs to be precise now. And exactly here, black can easily lose. I mean, just to show some, some lines. If you play king g7, for example, you do lose, really. You cannot save the game after king e5. The idea is rook d7. And um, something like rook here and f4 is strong. That's a very strong move. The idea is to, whatever black plays, you go f5 and you're threatening f6 now. So the capture is pretty much mandatory. But rook g1 check, king. Yeah, I can also go here. Got this, 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 and this is already a force checkmate. Yeah, e7 mate is the threat, and this is how it starts or ends. <laughs> However, you want to view it, the mating sequence is starting, but the game is uh, basically ending. Yeah, it is very dangerous, really. A move like king g7 um, just routine move or I don't know I don't know without any calculation let's say it's just losing a move like rook c3 is also losing probably losing I guess it's losing king e5 let's say king f8 f4 king e8 king f6 the invasion is very dangerous yeah now there are those threats or rook h1 to h8 yeah, black cannot save this she has to be really, really careful. Um, a move that seems to draw is um, given by, by the engines. King f8, this really seems to draw due to one very uh, nice move, king e5, and then rook f3. This is a key move. It has this idea and, of course, the idea to capture. However, this is a very, very narrow path to the draw. Um, one line that illustrates how narrow this path is is the following. It is a very long line, but it shows that um, it's not at all an easy draw. Check, king g7, b6, then the white king is very, very active. Rook a7, rook d7, takes, takes, and we already see what will happen here. Black has to sacrifice the rook on... on um, on d7 to ultimately get to the draw. Rook d2, rook c1 to cover the c file. Um, b4, king c7, a4, queen, this, this. And this is ultimately, ultimately a draw. I mean, this line is, is, is really, really long, but um, it shows how narrow this, this this path is g5 and uh, ultimately here the the king and the and the g pawn will draw of course um, not able to calculate this so easily i mean this is not beyond the capability of those players but it is a very very deep line um she played it differently and ultimately in a way that leads to a draw but this wasn't easy to see really not she played rook a4. This is a very radical solution. I mean, just getting rid of uh, one pair of rooks. Um, it completely, it wrecks the pawn structure. So hmm, it, it it kind of does not feel like the best solution. King f8 maybe is the, the clean hmm, draw. But, um, well, it seems to lead to a draw, ultimately. King e5, king to g7. King to d6. Yeah, note that um, something like this is even losing. White has to be has to be a bit careful. Yeah, King d6, however, is is, is quite logical. 
Um, there are other other tries, however. White can try rook a1, for example, a move that we looked at during the broadcast. Black, however, draws with rook b7. She must play that, but it is a draw. Rook a4 and checks. This is one key, those checks from the side. Rook b6 check. King d7, king f6, and this is stopping the pawn. This, this has to be played and rook c1. Setting up this, this kind of thing. Rook e8, yeah, doesn't look uh, very active, but there is no other move. Rook e8, king e5, intending to go to f6. And here again, it's a, it's a, a question of finding the only moves. It is probably not super difficult to do, but it's really just one misstep and you're done. She went a3, the only move, king f6, a2. Um, here white also had this idea. I think this was, um, this, this I had suggested um, during the broadcast, if I'm not mistaken. But black draws here as well with rook a8, king f6 and a2. And white has to return. Yeah, something something like that is a is a possible line. This, this, this. And here there is no way forward for white. Yeah, we can do this kind of thing. But it is it's still just a draw. Um in the game, king f6 was played, is also the, the more obvious move a2 was necessary it's still a thin line if black goes for this move for example to try to set up for counterplay he or she in this case will lose rook c5 funny rook a8 and now the fantastic move rook c2 the idea is f4 and rook h2 and this is in fact winning it's kind of remarkable. G5, F4, takes, rook H2, and king G8, rook G2 check, king H7, E7, and white wins. The pawn here will promote, and all those pawns are stopped by the rook. A really amazing line. There are many pitfalls, but, well, she navigated this perfectly. A2, rook A1, rook B8. Yeah, a key move activating the rook. F4 was played now. Yeah, it's um, clear that rook a2 was the main alternative. But black is drawing now. Um, drawing, in fact, with rook b5 or rook b4, but not with rook b3 because of f4. <laughs> uh, some tricky lines. However, rook b4 is the most obvious move anyway, I think, to um, have this, this check. And just prevent f4. Yeah, why allow it? Um, this is this is leading to to the draw pretty straightforwardly. Like this, 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 and this is a draw. Yeah, black is just controlling the pawn. Um, f4 is what he tried. Rook b4 had to be played. F5 takes. Rook takes. Yeah, white was giving up this pawn to get this umbrella situation where the f pawn is the shield against uh, the checks from the back, but black can still draw with exactly one move, rook h4. This was forced, the only move to draw, and it's the draw because of this checks here on h6. Yeah, they continued for a while, black has to go back. King e8, controlling uh, this square, and again check, and back to h1 to have the check against king f6. Yeah, after some more moves, they agreed to a draw. This was an interesting rook end game. Um, there were, in fact, even even more lines. I skipped a couple to make this video. I mean, this, this will be uh, this will be epically long anyway. But um, yeah, there was even more content, uh, is what I'm trying to say, um, than what I actually <laughs> presented. OK, now to the final uh, games of this um, this coverage. We are starting, I'm not quite sure what is uh, the most uh, sensible order for this. Um, let's do Giri Jobava. They are all interesting, really interesting. 
Okay, Giri Jubava. Okay, classical King's Indian, so a slightly more, uh, let's say, normal <laughs> opening for Jubava standard. Still, it's very sharp, and we get to the bayonet attack in short order. And here, very early, in fact, Jobaba is coming up with a surprise. He plays knight to f4, bishop f1, and f5. And this line is actually known from the very early days of the of the bayonet attack when it was um, yeah revitalized in the in the early um, 1990s. Um, and back then, it was the common belief that this is F, this is unplayable for black, really, due to bishop takes, pawn takes, e5. And um, the assessment back then was that white has um, a fantastic advantage. And I had a look um, at, um, at recent developments. There is absolutely no change to this um, evaluation. White is believed to be substantially better. And, uh, well, the score is 87%. In my my big database, um, it's very uh, surprising that Jubaba allowed that, and Giri didn't play it, and uh, it's a bit mysterious. Um, I, I didn't see the press conference. Would be interesting to know. The thing is that this is this is really bad for Black. There is there is absolutely no way to to um, to get something here. The problem is that White is basically playing here with five against four pawns. And it can be critical for black really, really quickly. I mean, probably he only has to move a5 now in this position. If he plays any any slowish move, I mean, let's say, okay, it looks it lo looks weird, but let's say h6, yeah, to prepare g5, then c5, knight b5, it, it will kill you. Yeah, this is a winning position already. Um, white has possibilities like that. I had this on the board once in a tournament game, and this was like, I mean, I won this game, uh, I spent, I think, 20 minutes on the clock, and it was um, it was resigns after about 20 moves. Um, I, I really don't know why he didn't take on f4. He went a4. This is not leading to a bad position, but it's, 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 it's very mysterious why they... <laughs> why Jobava allowed that and Giri didn't play it. Okay, we get to a very very sharp position now. Rook a3, an interesting move, setting up possibilities to get the rook over, not as an attacking device, but this is a prophylactic move. It uh, might cover on the third rank, and we see that this uh, will become important later in the game. It also keeps the g3 knight protected, which looks unimportant, but, um, well, it is important. <laughs> Let's see, g4, a5, h5. So both sides are playing on their own, as uh, Joel Benjamin stated. Yeah, they push their their pawns forward, they care about their business, and they ignore the other side. Okay, knight c4, knight g6. Takes, takes, knight b5. Yeah, that looks very, very logical. Yeah, White is attacking this, this weakness on d6. How is black going to defend this? Yeah, he has to play rook f6. They reach this position, and this is, um, I mean, we had critical situations earlier, but this is the first um, really, really critical position um, that is not um, within the knowledge of theory, let's say. The big question here for Giri was, should, should you play g3 or not? The move g3... Uh, he played it, I can tell you that much. The move g3 looks... Um, it is always a problem if you move pawns in front of your king when you are the side that is under attack. Um, here, black has already a couple of pieces near the king, and very often you don't want to move the pawns. However, here g3 is, of course, a very, very... Um, yeah, direct way to, to refute what black um, black is setting up here. Uh, let's say the, the knight the knight cannot move. Let's start with that. If the knight moves somewhere, I mean, let's say he gives a check. White is going to take. And can even play bishop g5. And this is really not working at all. Uh, yeah, so pin d6 falls. 
and um, yeah, black has no attack. You cannot move the knight at all. I mean, retreating is is also also quite terrible. Note that we already see that this rook is doing something in terms of at least protecting a little bit on the on the king side. So g3 essentially is like it's called like calling a bluff in a way. Yeah? Let's say, show me, show me what you got. Um, and well, <laughs> Jobava really showed him something. <laughs> we, we, we will see uh, we'll see what happens. Um, my suggestion when we broadcast this live was Bishop e3. I, I didn't want to move move pawns there. Um, it seems to be not that bad, like this, for example, then takes complicated stuff. I mean, I would still be very afraid here as white. Black has many pieces near the near the king. Um, this also just look quite okay for white, yeah? But g3, well, from a technical point of view, if you give it to a chess engine, it says g3 wins, but uh, <laughs> that's only half of the story. We see, we see what happens. Takes, takes, and a6. Yeah, in this position, um, White had a had a possibility to um, to win even more material. Giri could have played knight b6, going for this rook in the corner. Takes, takes, and probably f takes e4. What a position! Yeah, White has won an exchange, and the f4 knight is hanging. A very very uh, tense situation um, and very hard to evaluate ultimately Giri didn't go for that it is really very unclear something like let's say takes here can be answered with bishop to f5 knight b6 is a possible line and then black takes and what position is that black is a rook down a complete rook but those pawns <laughs> are very, very dangerous. If you imagine a situation where black has pushed f3, yeah, the white king can be checkmated really, really quickly. Yeah, Queen somehow to h4, rook to h6, something. I mean, this is very dangerous. Um, Giri went knight c3, and after this, we get um, the most um, spectacular move of this tournament so far. Uh, funny enough, by the tail end of the of the field, um, Jubava now played the amazing move knight to h4, yeah, setting up a self fork <laughs> in a way. Yeah, so he already had one knight hanging, and he yeah, puts the second knight also up for the taking. Uh, yeah, now the situation is completely unclear. Yeah, I mean unclear in a way like dynamic equality. Yeah, if you analyze it a little bit deeper. A shocking move, really. Um, the first thing to check is, well, can you take it? Well, you can't. <laughs> After this, rook h6 and then queen h4, white will lose. Yeah, it's, it is no defense to this attack. For example, if we look at this. Checkmate is the threat. And here, black has all the time in the world. Bishop takes. Yeah, those pieces are not helping that much, and f3 is going to hit. Yeah, let's say here, here, and rook f8. This is a decisive attack. White has absolutely no defense to this. I mean, black is not even material down. Yeah, it's uh, just just a pawn. Yeah, the attack is is, is far too strong. Um, can you take the other knight? Nope. For mate to come. Yeah, note that if White um, tries to tries to sacrifice the queen to somehow continue, we're not even taking that. This will lead to a mate um, in very short order. Um, yeah, so you cannot take uh, the knights. <laughs> so what did he do? Giri took to quite a long thing and then played knight to e2. Yeah, this is a very good practical solution to this. It um, tries to trade the g4 knight, and not only tries, it accomplishes to trade the knight, and it shows <laughs> why this rook can be a useful piece. <laughs> In this case, it was used to sacrifice the exchange. And what he managed with this is to get rid of both attacking knights. 
black now took on e2 that's better than um taking here this position is really nice for white yeah, it's a that's a secure uh, that's not right this is a secure configuration pressure on d6 yeah, and white will pick up this pawn that's, that's really nice for white so this is better we see that here here black has won the exchange for one pawn so white has um, a knight and a pawn for the rook which is um, almost um, sufficient compensation anyway in terms of material but white also has some other assets here like knight coming to b6 so it is um, a position with uh, with compensation um, bishop to h6 trading this bishop makes lots of sense king g2 we had to get rook h1 in black now trade it and f4 it's possible that this was a bit more precise white really didn't have any special um, attack uh, going and one point of this move is that if white now wants to go to the h file we can actually take and look at this f2 <coughs> this f2 pawn f4 is allowing rook h1 which is not really a problem but uh, maybe queen f8 was a little bit more precise rook g6 rook h5 queen f8 queen h1 note that one feature of this um, this position is that the knight on b6 is just limiting those two pieces very considerably the knight cannot move uh, sorry the bishop cannot move um, the only possible square would be g4 but other than that he's a bit paralyzed on the other hand it's not clear how white um, is going to increase his pressure queen f6 queen h2 queen h2 is a clever move it, it just uh, passes the right to move to black and um, asks him in a way okay what are you going to do um, it's um, in fact not so easy to do anything as, as black or to do something takes takes queen g7 this is what the computer suggests suggests um, after that it probably is equal there are some ways to illustrate that maybe like this in this line for example we get to a situation where where it is equal yeah if white tries to avoid the perpetual by taking after rook f8 he risks to be he risks to be worse in the game jubava played a different move he didn't take on g3 he played after some thought the move bishop to g4 and it turns out that this is losing it's just losing on the spot takes takes and now the move queen h3 yeah we mostly during the live broadcast looked at knight d7 but this is this is a bit complicated queen g6 is the point after which knight takes queen takes and this is in fact leading to a draw by a perpetual check i mean it's not totally obvious maybe but it is really the case white cannot um, really um, do something against it um the move queen h3 i mean 97 by the way is winning but you have to be very precise the move queen h3 is is much much simpler um what is black's move now he actually played this move but what, what else is there you cannot do this <clears throat> because of rook h8 if you go here you're running into this and you have uh, yeah you have just um, killed the counterplay with queen queen g6 yeah white wins also very effortlessly effortlessly queen g6 was played the point is that now after the rook check here here black is getting this move in and draws funny move this is in fact a perpetual check quite remarkable it's however not necessary white has a much better move and this was played by giri the final move of the game king f3 <laughs> funny yeah? the king steps forward it covers e4 and it threatens queen takes g4 and the rook is basically trapped now 
Yeah, the only way to try to save it is this. But then you go here, take b8, and black does not even have a check. So white is uh, white is completely winning. Yeah, after king f3, Jubaba resigned the game. Yeah, what a shame. It was a it was a really great attacking effort. Yeah, I mean this this was really great. Here. What a shocker. Yeah. It really deserved um, at least half a point, I'd say, but it, it does not help. Yeah. If you um, make um, a relatively, I mean, simple is, is the wrong word, but it's uh, when you look at this, I mean, if you calculate bishop g4 takes, takes, what kind of move um, are you, are you, are you, what are you calculating here? I mean, queen h3 is uh, certainly a move you should check. And knight d7, in fact, also wins. It's just more complicated. Um, so this is really not working at all in the move bishop g4. Maybe he just wanted uh, wanted too much and um, didn't really uh, consider this to be uh, yeah good enough. Maybe he just wanted, I mean, no, taking is actually more precise. Takes, takes, and all this. Maybe he simply wanted more and um, and discarded this on, on that account. Um, it's hard to tell, but a very spectacular and interesting game. Yeah, with this result, Giri is um, moving up to a plus one score. And Jubaba really, with just a draw out of five rounds, yeah, having a miserable tournament. Um, it all started with this um, this oversight yeah, in round one where he blundered into the losing king and pawn in game against Ivan Shuk. Yeah, let's continue. We still have two games to go and we're already one hour into this video. Yeah, I suspected it would be quite long, but well, yeah, let's uh, let's continue. We have Wojtaszek, Radoslav Wojtaszek with white against Caruana, the world number two with black. Yeah. What a shake is a d4 player. Here we go. And what is Caruana playing now? <laughs> Very interestingly, he's going for f5, <laughs> playing the Dutch defense, um, just um, as Carlsen did against Wojtaszek. Carlsen um, went for a different um, a move order, but <laughs> it's still funny yeah, that Caruana is, uh, is doing the same opening. Okay, c4, <laughs> knight f6, g3. We get a somewhat different uh, setup now. In fact, we get the modern main line of the Leningrad Dutch with c6. The move c6 in recent years um, gained um, prominence over queen e8. Queen e8 was the traditional main line here since the, the late 1980s when it was championed by uh, Vladimir Malanyuk, amongst others. And Mikhail Gurevich, those were the pioneers of the Leningrad Dutch back then. Um, nowadays, it is believed that uh, white maybe has a little something with d5 here. Yeah? While after c6, which is the move that is played also in this game, while after c6, the move d5 has lost uh, some of its appeal due to e5. It was already known back um, for a long time that e5 is a solid for black. But some games have shown that this kind of structure is really not to be feared. The d6 pawn looks weak, but black has a very um, a good central control. This f5 pawn is, is very essential in controlling e4. And uh, it seems that white has nothing there. There were a, game, a couple of games by uh, Hikaru Nakamura, by the way, who um, showed black's chances very convincingly in this, this position type. So white started to play other moves here. Kromnik played queen uh, rook b1 for example yeah or here rook e1 is played. Knight a6 typical way to develop the knight in the in the Leningrad Dutch yeah very often um, a knight development like this is not really that great because of the e6 square being weak yeah you very often want the knight here this can be an actually a pretty decent post yeah looking here okay b3 knight e4 takes this happened knight c5 funny idea <laughs> yeah the knight is uh, using this little tactic or let's say tactic is a bit much this pin um to reposition itself 
knight g5 to prevent a direct knight e4. d5, so we're mixing a landing grid and stone wall now. Knight to h3, here, here. Yeah, why knight to h3? He wants to get here ultimately. The knight on d3 is very nicely placed. Yeah, what is this position? How to um, evaluate it? Um, probably white is a little bit better, but um, it shouldn't be anything very substantial. Let's see how it um, continues. This a5, a4. Yeah, and now Caruana initiates um, initiates a very um, active active plan that looked um, quite normal to us also in the broadcast, but. At the end of the day, it's not clear that this is so great. Um, he played the move b5 very active and um, somewhat in spirit of, of the Dutch and the Leningrad in particular, you have to have to be active because some of the strategic features of the position are not really in your favor. But b5, let's say let's see what happens. Takes, takes here. This this position. Was, uh, was coming up. And the question is, what about this A pawn? Is this uh, a weakness? As Wojtoszek played it, it looked really, really like this is a big weakness. He went rook a3. This is a strong move with queen a1 being a possibility. And um, a very really funny thing is, if you <laughs> think back the game Wojtoszek Carlsen, Wojtoszek <laughs> won the A pawn in this game against the world champion as well and here look what happens hmm this pawn is falling black is starting a counter attack on the king side and that's it for the pawn yeah where did it go wrong it's not so easy to say maybe the b5 plan is really, yeah, maybe it's really not uh, not the way to go. It's hard to find an improvement over the course of these moves. You probably can be um, can be more precise, but the idea f3, sorry, f3, bishop c3, we, I have to do it differently to get the, get the arrows. f3, bishop c3, king, uh, queen a1, this regrouping, piling up on the pawn, is very difficult to counter. I mean, hmm, I really don't know how. An idea that I had um, in the during the broadcast was, I actually I had I proposed this move, trying to put it on b5, but this is probably also not leading to that much if we think about this. Let's say here, here, yeah, and again. Uh, even queen d2, rook a1 here. Yeah. I don't know. Probably the a pawn is just a weakness. Yeah. B5, maybe this is too loose. Yeah. The way it went in the game, the a pawn got lost, and Kawana started this um, started this kingside attack. This is a good move, rook c1. Yeah, this prepares bishop e1 as a defense. And also knight c5. This is how it developed. Got this trades in, and now we only have bishops on the board. No knights. Means that the position is becoming a little bit more, a little bit more static. Yeah, the knights always, yeah, give some, some, some. How, what's the word? Like quirkiness. <laughs> it makes the position often a bit less predictable. And here um, we see that. White is enjoying this pawn, and hmm, where is Black's play? Um, Caruana played this nicely, actually. He played e5, a move that not so easily um, comes to you, as you <laughs> think that d4 and f4 just prevents that. But <clears throat> it is a playable move. And the point is that after something like f takes, Black will take, take, and play bishop e7. Uh, White has very decent compensation for the exchange that he will lose, 
but at least the position I mean, gets out of balance. Balance is also hmm. this is not a balanced position, but it 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 adds some 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 chaos to the to the situation that uh, Caruana is welcome is welcoming. Um, Wojciechek, however, did not um, even go for that. He took and went to b1, attacking f5. Not a not a bad option. Black takes. He took on f5. Yeah, and now um, it becomes um, a very interesting. Queen e6 <clears throat> was an option here, probably a better option to limit the 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 um, the disadvantage that that Black has. Um, he played Queen e3, however, very obvious move, um, but it seems uh, not a very good one. After Bishop f2. He retreated, and now White could have gotten a really clear advantage with the move, not this, <laughs> with the move Queen to b1. The idea is to set up this configuration where a possible Bishop f5 will be a very big issue for the g4 pawn. White has a very substantial advantage here. He played this, however, and after this, it wasn't. Um, that bad anymore for black. Here he could have played rook a3 and after this is not clear that that white is having having that much. For example after b4 the move d3 is leading to very dangerous counterplay. Yeah, no it's equal material. White is not up any material. Yes the b pawn but black well, this is a double pawn. This is also an advanced passer. So mm, this is giving enough counterplay. Instead of rook a3, but we, by the way, we have to note that Caruana had no time on the clock. Very, very limited time. He played d3, trying to, to activate activate the bishop on, on f6. And it really seems that this is not leading to, to anything. White took it. And d4. Now b4 was played. Black can try to stir up some trouble now, but ultimately the b pawn will decide the game. He tried bishop to b3. b5. Yo, the pawn. Bishop e7. Note that if he tries Bishop here, Bishop e4 is covering this thing. Bishop f3 is a very serious threat, but we, we can cover it. d3, let's say, rook d5, rook a4. This is a, a plausible line that ultimately leads to a winning position for white, rook d6 or rook d5. This is what he played, but after rook h5, Rook d1, bishop e2, he won the g pawn. Rook b2, rook f3, bishop b4, and b6. The pawn is ultimately just promoting. Yeah, and uh, Caruana is, um, is um, yeah, he resigned now and, um, and lost this game in the Dutch defense, just as Magnus Carlsen did three days ago against... Radek Wojtaszek. So Wojtaszek won two games with white on the on the white side of the Leningrad Dutch against the world number one and the world number two. A fantastic result. And he now with his two wins is also in the, um, in the group to, to pursue Ivanchuk, who's leading with plus three, but he's now on plus two. Excellent result by, by Wojtaszek. Yeah, maybe Caruana's opening choice um, ultimately... Um, yeah, costs him. It seems that Wojtaszek is playing this uh, kind of position excellently on the white side, uh, winning against the two best uh, players in the world in the, in the time span of three days is, is quite remarkable. Okay, one more game in this coverage. Carlsen Aronian. Yeah, I've sa saved this for last by no, but for no particular reason, to be honest. It was... Um, just the way uh, the printout went for my notes. <laughs> okay, let's see. We have a Ragozin again. 
bishop g5, h6. And Carlsen is keeping it simple, just as his, this is basically his, um, his trademark style. He just takes on f6. Here, bishop h4 is possible, but leads to very, very sharp complications after g5, for example, or sometimes even c5 and then g5. Yeah, um, He just took, takes, takes, e uh, queen a4, sorry. This, this, this line is not considered to be very, very critical against the, um, the Rogozin, but what it does, it, it leads to a very, um, yeah, let's say tidy positions, yeah, positions that are mostly um, are about strategic planning. And this is, of course, what Carlsen is excellent about. This is all very normal. Bishop d6. Yeah, black hat played a6 to make sure that knight b5 is not hitting and white retreats with the queen. That's the typical way to play it. You have played queen to a4 to force the knight to c6 where it is not optimally placed, but uh, you had to spend some time with the queen in the process. Now white has this knight a4 to c5 idea. Um, in this position, black very often seeks counterplay on the on the king side and um, I'm not sure if um, Aronian setup 97 looks normal but now the the setup that he that he goes for in the next couple of moves looks a bit dubious to me and um, also to the <laughs> to the other commentators I mean Joe Benjamin wasn't so skeptical about black's chances but we see that Black is getting into into some issues relatively quickly. B4, and um, and here the next move. I really don't don't like that one. <laughs> he played um, he played now knight to c8. Um, when when I saw this, I was thinking that he probably angles for this idea, trying to put the knight here, maybe even b5, knight b6, knight c4. But the strange thing is that well. Carson played knight a4, going for this uh, this destined square, and now black went b6, preventing that. When you intend to do that, why had you put knight on c8 in the first place? I really don't don't know the rationale behind that. Maybe he wanted to provoke exactly that. So, I mean, maybe he was thinking, I'm threatening knight b6, so. He actually has to do this, but white is not uh, subjecting to that, I believe. So the the thing that, that makes me skeptical about this is the whole idea. I mean, if you look at this, white is regrouping to d3, which is not a bad square. The knight is looking at many critical spots here. Knight g6, a4. I was, I was aiming at this position. Here in this uh, situation, White has various ideas. One idea is even also to go a5. And black felt inclined to prevent that with this. And now we get this position. And this was basically what Aronian allowed with this knight c8 b6 setup. This structure, the pure structure, is just very nice for white. The c7 pawn and the d5 pawn, they need some protection. And if you just imagine any type of endgame that might arise, a minor piece endgame, almost all of them, rook endgames, all of those are just a lot better for white. And this makes the play difficult for black to conduct because you cannot uh, allow trades so easily. If we see what happened in the game, yeah, white doubled, 92, g3, strong move, Strengthening the the king side, and this this is a trademark of, of a really this is a really strong move. Yeah, it it does not look very apparent. Yeah, White has structurally speaking a nice bishop. Why does he trade it? The the point is any trade favors White in this position. As mentioned, all the end games are good for him. And look the, look at this position. With the bishops traded, the d5 pawn has actually become a little bit more vulnerable. The bishop on e6, while not being very great, <laughs> uh, 
it at least covered the pawn but this is gone now and see that a move like queen f3 sets black very very annoying problems he really cannot take getting to this end game would be a torture yeah knight to e5 is an idea and those weaknesses they don't go away note that a move like f6 which covers e5 runs into this kind of situation and here you're almost lost <laughs> it's really it's just it's it's that bad so he had to keep the queens on the board queen g5 h4 and rook c6 and it's just very uncomfortable for black this kind of situation you have no activity whatsoever and uh, white has all the time in the world to try to improve the traits as mentioned are all unfavorable for you very difficult position to play knight f6 is normal i guess knight f4 and here black had to hang on with something like bishop to b4 probably yeah this this kind of move bishop b4 not not quite sure what white is doing he can even retreat the queen black whatever he should do he shouldn't move anything he shouldn't do anything substantial he just has to sit and wait which is never a really good good thing a good situation to be in but uh, the thing is what he did he, he did something um but this um really backfired badly <clears throat> g6 was Aronian's move but this really yeah it almost loses i guess after h5 <clears throat> sorry um black really has no move after that the normal looking move is g5 but white can really just take Yeah, and this is really winning. Yeah? It's not even like better for white. It's a winning position. Um, the big problem is that there is also this here. How do you untangle? Very difficult. Let's say black is playing. Hmm, I don't really see a move. If you move the bishop, yeah, then, then this hits. Right, if you move this, this is coming. There's really no defense. Yeah, in the game he went king g7, but this is not helping either. Takes, takes, knight takes, 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 and here. Well, alternatively, bishop a3 is answered by this and wins. Yeah, he took on g3, queen back, and knight c4 very comparable to the line that we had had seen before yeah here the point is that g6 is under much pressure there is knight e5 as a big threat and sometimes knight takes d6 there is no no defense to that rook f8 was played knight e5 yeah, with a fork essentially took it and now g6 is falling always checks and now the final touch is uh, the move rook c4 that's the quickest way to win there were other wins but this is uh, using the final piece um, in the attack he went with this check yeah a line to to calculate for white was check and check and but you have e4 this was the little key move that had to be seen beforehand after queen takes rook f6 white is um, going to win in short order the yeah, Aronian gave this check and went for rook h8 but white is just having this decisive attack with uh, with his heavy pieces and here Aronian resigned there is no defense anymore you can do something like this but this is winning now cutting the connection between the two pieces after queen takes the check is the decisive move winning the queen so a win for carlson the second win in a row he started very in a very slow way uh, losing against wojtaszek after some draws and uh, but now two wins against van veli and now against aronian yeah carlson has an excellent score now against aronian he hasn't lost to him since uh, 2009 really a long time um and um, Aronian is really looking 
out of shape in this event. I mean, he had a pretty rotten 2014 anyway. After winning Tata Steel in the in the in the first weeks of the year, it never he never really got to to a good form, and um, this continues here in the in the Tata Steel event this year. Um, he's on minus two, if I'm not mistaken, and this is um, really in no way um, reflecting his actual actual strength when he is um, in good shape. Yeah, Carlsen is in 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 contention again with the plus one, and uh, well, he will play today um, when this video is released. <laughs> he will play um, against um, Caruana, so very important encounter. Caruana with the white pieces. Mm. Let's see. Will be interesting, I hope. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this very long video, but this was a round full of interesting games, so it was difficult to make it uh, really, really brief. Yeah, thanks for watching.